Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is Nick Loper. Uh, Nick is a successful podcaster. You may have heard of him. Uh, he's got the Side Hustle Show. It's every time I look, one of the top 100 uh, podcasts on iTunes wildly popular podcast. He's also the author of several books, uh, including a book called The Side Hustle, a book called The Virtual Assistant Assistant, a few other books. He's got a book coming out soon. Um, Nick and I have known each other for a long time, and we've jammed on book marketing stuff, gosh, for years. Seven and years, seven <laughs> years. Actually, this month, was, and we went back prior to that, but it was seven years ago this month where I was like actually putting some concerted effort into a book launch yeah. and you call me up midweek uh, and you're like, what's your, what's your plan here? And I was like, I I'm doing it. And he's like, no, no, no. You gotta, you gotta wean off the free launch. And you had all this stuff. And I was <laughs> like, that was the moment. That was the moment I became a Chandler Bolt fan. Man. And then uh, dude, that's so fun to look back and think about. I totally forgot about that. But then just, I don't know, all the way to now and just to see how much your podcast has grown and how much you've grown. And you've always been a big supporter of self-publishing school from the early days. So a lot of our early growth was because of you and, and your support and Side Hustle Nation uh, support and SBS. So it's been awesome, man. So guys, today we're going to be talking about a, a few things, growing a podcast successfully, um, how he's published books so successfully, uh, we might even get into using podcasts to sell more books, talk a little bit about his upcoming book project. What is it? How is he looking at it differently? Honestly, I've got so many questions that I don't even know if we're going to be able to get to them all. Uh, <laughs> but I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's do it, man. I'm happy to geek out on this stuff. Yeah, well, great to have you here, Nick. Um, let's dive in. So first off, just kind of more broadly, why did you write your first book and why books? Like you've got a decent amount of books. It's a core part of your business. Why? Honestly, it was to be an authority building project. So my first book was called Virtual Assistant Assistant, which Chandler mentioned. It um, at the time was running a, a website called virtualassistantassistant.com. It was a directory and review platform for different outsourcing companies. And at that time, this is 2012, um, I didn't really want to, in, the site looked pretty bad. Like it wasn't, you know, didn't instill a whole lot of trust if somebody landed on the page. So rather than invest in a redesign or upgrading the theme or something like that, my theory was like, oh, I'll put a little book tab at the top. People will come to the site. They'll be like, well, he wrote the book on the subject. So he must be somewhat knowledgeable about this. We'll, we'll trust this website. What ended up happening, which was kind of an eye-opening experience was, um, I, my expectation was people would come to the site, see that there was a book, go buy the book on Amazon. What ended up happening instead was people went to Amazon, searched for virtual assistant, found the book, then went to the website. It was completely backwards and through the magic of affiliate link tracking and stuff. Like I know very few people went down the path that I expected them to. And so I remember I got my first royalty checks for like $42 and 47 cents or something. And I was thrilled. I was like, I, I'm a professional author, like somebody bought my thing. It was so exciting. Um, and that book has gone on to sell for, for years and years. Um, and actually recently sold the website that it was attached to, but I have, have had uh, self-publishing as kind of part of the side hustle portfolio uh, ever since then. Mm. So it starts out self-publishing as a side hustle and to, to feed this business that you have. Why do you think that is? And, and how do you look at that? Because it seems like it's smart. It's strategic. Um, I had uh, Mike Michalowicz on here um, on the podcast, gosh, 10, 20 episodes ago, maybe yeah. a little bit more, but he he also kind of strategically has a book per, per business unit. And it seems like you've got kind of done similarly. Did that spark that? Like, all right, we've got, like, I'm going to do a book. Like, why do you think that is that the books, that it is book first instead of website first? Because I feel like that's counterintuitive. And then yeah. how have you kind of approached that strategically? I mean, the big light bulb for me there was it, the power of these mini search engines. And Amazon, you know, is probably a top five search engine in the world, or in, at least in the States. Um, so it's hard, it's hard even to call it mini. But that was kind of the, uh, the realization for me. It's like, go where the cash is already flowing. And that actually spawned one of my follow-up books, which is called Buy Buttons, which that's basically the hypothesis behind it. Go where the cash is already flowing. There's already all these marketplaces where you can kind of raise your hand, put your thing up for sale on, rather than trying to, you know, stake your claim in the middle of some 
you know, unknown digital wilderness and hoping people find you, but go where these, uh, go where the customers already are. Um, that was the, the big takeaway for me there. That makes sense. And, and, and it's like, I always say it's Google is a search engine of browsers. Amazon is a search engine of buyers. It's right. Like everyone's focused on SEO and, and ranking on Google, which is smart. We definitely do that as well, but they're, they're ignoring, I think Amazon, which is, you know, millions and millions of people with their credit card on file there for one reason and one reason only, and that's to buy stuff. And so it's like, yeah. I always think about, and I know we're, we think the same way on this is, is how do you channel folks into your ecosystem when they're in a buying atmosphere and when they're, when they're searching in that way, it's a bit of a pivot, but I know, um, I think you, you just, um, speaking of kind of SEO, you just released an, uh, an SEO course. And so can you talk a little bit about that of like search engine optimization? What is it? Uh, maybe just the, at, at the basics, but like, how do you see that plan out? Cause you've got a site, you've got a podcast, you've got books and you were talking about like all these micro search engines, like how do you <laughs> approach that? And what's the overlap? I know that's a big question. Yeah. So SEO is the art and science of um, ranking your content in Google and other search engines, it's basically Google. You know, if you if you play by their rules, odds are you're going to be uh, perfectly visible in other search engines. Um, for me, that's been um, that's been a focus. You know, for the last probably three or four years, where before I would write content that I wanted to write, that came to my head, that I thought would be a fun idea, and it would spend hours and hours and hours creating this stuff, and you get you know this tiny little spike, you know, the day that you hit publish on it, because you had, you know, maybe 500, 1,000, ex, you know, existing subscribers that you could push it out to. And then it was done. It was like this weird, very, it was almost like a social media post, like a tweet, like it's gone, it's here today, and then it's gone. Um, but I had a couple, you know, put a put a, bunk, a bunch of monkeys in rooms with typewriters, and eventually they write Shakespeare, right? Um, over the course of thousands of, of blog articles, a few of them did hit. And I was like, well, how come this one gets consistent traffic? How come that one continues to get page views and visits like over, over time? And it's like, well, people are discovering that organically through Google. And one of the first ones was like totally random pre side hustle nation. My first like taste of this was how does restaurant.com work or something like some random article that I was like curious about. It's like, what they're selling these $25 gift cards for, for three bucks. I like, I like free food. How does it work? You know, what's their business model? Try to deconstruct that. Um, but that's been um, a definitely a learning curve of trying to create content that's better than anything else out there, right? If you put yourself in Google's shoes, what do they want to do? They want to uh, maintain their dominant position as the world's foremost answer engine. And so if you can answer the person's query better than what is already out there, you know, with your unique mm. flavor to it, then I think you're going to stand uh, a good chance as just a bare minimum entry. And then of course, there's all sorts of content structure and technical elements and links and everything else. But that's essentially what you want to do is provide the best answers to the user's query. That's great. And it's, I think this is something that not, not a lot of people are thinking about in the way that you're thinking about it. And it's how you build a long-term evergreen sales engine. And so just to make this, I guess, super simple for folks, think about this guys for, for Nick, right? If someone's searching how to start a side hustle or how to make money from your side hustle or whatever, they can search that on Google. He probably shows up. They can search that in iTunes for a podcast of like, uh, uh, how to start a side hustle. They can search that on Amazon. They're going to find his book. Like, so it's, it's ranking in those kind of niche uh, search engines. Is that yeah. how you, how yeah. you think of, it? think of your, your primary keyword and how can you gain some exposure there? Cause you're not going to write, you know, blogging is much easier than writing a book. You know, podcasting is much easier than writing a book, even YouTube videos like, oh, okay. You know, but thinking of all these search engines where people can discover you. And that's the same, same way on, Amazon on Facebook, like where, if somebody searches side hustle on Facebook, I hope they find the free side hustle nation community. It's just another entry point, another top of the funnel uh, introduction to my brand, my content, the community there. Um, on Amazon, somebody pointed out, actually a, a community member pointed out like, you got a few books up here, but none of them really seem to be about side hustles because I had the virtual assistant book. I wrote a book about treadmill desks, which I was oddly passionate about years ago. It was like, I think it probably held the title, the world's best-selling topic on, uh, <laughs> best -selling book on the topic of, of treadmill desks, which, uh, you know, is very, a very small niche. Um, 
but didn't have any books about side hustles. And so the guy would, and I was like, well, I, I can fix that. You know, I've got all these interviews. And that was my first foray into kind of this perma free strategy was repurposing mm. some of the podcast interviews and went, actually went back and bulldozed that series last year, the year before, and kind of mm. rewrote that whole thing. But I wanted to keep the reviews from it because it had a couple hundred reviews. Um, so it was able to slide in um, an updated version of that book and slightly nice. change the title, change the cover. Yeah. Um, and that way, and, and again, when somebody searches side hustle on Amazon, I want them to find my stuff. They're going to find Chris Gilbo. They're going to find other people. That's fine too. But hopefully they say, well, well, this book's free on Kindle. Like it's permanently free. It's got decent reviews. Like I'll, I'll give it a shot. Right. And it's this at top of this funnel, this point of discovery that I would rather, um, I, I don't know, I'd rather capture some of that traffic than none of it. Yeah, no doubt. Now what, um, so can you talk to me? It, it sounds like, did you have the podcast first and then you did the series because the series felt in, or because um, the series solved a need and then you consolidated it into the book? Is that kind of you, how you uh, did that? Yeah. So these first um, kind of like podcast, you know, podcast to book uh, element was probably in the 2015 timeframe, a couple years deep into the show. And now it's, now it's really common. I mean, this is, Tim Ferriss, you know, puts out best-selling tools of Titans. And it's just, it's a lot of it just repurposed from the podcast. Like, okay, this makes sense. So I'd love to, like, what are a couple of things that you learned from, from that process that would apply to other people who have a podcast that are thinking about turning it into a book? Like, how did you do that? What did you learn? And how do you make sure that it's not, I think some people just having their idea, all right, we're just going to transcribe 50 podcast interviews and then publish that but that sucks and no one yeah. wants to read it or buy it. So like, ha- like, how do you do it in a way where it's actually quality? Yeah, there's definitely been an evolution here. And the first uh, attempt at that probably was not the, the best effort. So the first attempt was kind of like a summary of the podcast episode, not a straight transcription, but kind of like, yeah, here's what we talked about. Here were their top tips and here are some of the recommendations. And then it is, you know, on to the next interview where uh, I pivoted on that strategy a little bit is, you know, coming up with the, the main uh, idea or whatever that you want to come across and, you know, then finding examples uh, from the podcast and quotes to illustrate that. So in the newest version of the side hustle, it kind of breaks down the three main, you know, the big three business models, like selling a product, selling a service, and then, you know, the audience-based business, like a content-based business. And then, you know, able to pull examples from the podcast to illustrate the pros and cons and different examples underneath each of those umbrellas versus, um, versus just the, well, here's the transcript, throw it up, throw it up yeah, on Amazon. For sure. So what would be your tips to people who are thinking about doing this? Say I've got 50, hundred episodes in the can. How do I crystallize that and, and, and go from kind of podcast to quality book? Yeah, you may have, if you got a hundred episodes, you may have two or three books in there. So what I started to look for was uh, commonalities. Like what are the common themes or threads that kind of run through these interviews? And one was the, what turned into buy buttons was this, um, uh, this commonality of, you know, starting out on some pre-existing marketplace rather than trying to, you know, build your own shop in the middle of the wilderness. Um, and so was able to pull examples from the podcast, like, oh, these people sold on Amazon. They sold on Udemy. They set up shop on Airbnb, right? And so that was one that came out. Um, which I think what was another examples from the podcast? Like, and then just in the recent uh, side hustle example, it was, or the side hustle book example, it was, um, just finding different examples to illustrate. Well, what if I don't have any skills? Like, well, here are, you know, three examples of business models that you could do from the podcast uh, with people who, you know, not a lot, of, it's not a lot of rocket science involved with either of these. Like you could probably figure this stuff out. Um, that's how I tend to approach it. So you have this treasure trove of content that you've created. And lately I've been using, I don't know if you use this as well, um, but use otter.ai to get everything transcribed. And it's not 100% perfect, but now you can go back and search for specific phrases. And that's really helpful to find uh, specific quotes and sound bites that you need to pull back out versus, uh, you know, for the first several years, it was like just 
okay, I, I think it was about, you know, halfway through this episode, they mentioned something and just like a pain mm. in the butt trying to pull quotes. For sure. Okay. So you're, 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 you're reflecting back. You're saying, all right, I've got, I'm going to consolidate these few themes. All right. Now that's going to be, I mean, it's kind of similar to what we teach of like the mind map outline, right? So you get your mind map yeah. that starts to form the outline and then, and then you're plugging in kind of episodes with that. Are you going, do you go transcribe, drop into the doc? Do you go, Hey, I want to, I want to start from scratch so that I'm not having to, do a ton of moving and editing or how do you go kind of go about that that writing process i kind of start outline first and then fill in the gaps with content that i already have or that could be massaged into that place whether it's a, a blog post that talked about you know how to narrow down if you have too many side hustle ideas how do you narrow that down maybe there's a blog article on that um you know pros and cons of different business models maybe there's an article on that um you know, how to scale a service business. Maybe there's an article on that. And so that makes me feel like I'm not starting from a completely blank page. Like, okay, I have the outline and then I have some sections that are kind of filled in. They're going to need some editing, but it's, it's not, um, it's not as demoralizing as like staring at the blinking cursor and be like, all right, oh, here we go. 50,000 words. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, looking for the, and in, in the outline, you might have just in your mind, like, oh, um, you know, so-and-so, or, you know, this episode is going to be, uh, you know, the, the example we're going to use to illustrate this point. Yeah, that's great. Now, so that's how you get the book written and kind of how to go from, from podcast to book. I think that'll be super helpful for people. Now let's go kind of back on track with the marketing stuff. What, which book is sold the best? Why? And, and what sold the most copies? Um, in terms of moving the most copies, uh, the free one, it's hard, it's hard to compete with free. Um, so that just plugs away 20, 30, 40, 50 units a day. And then sometimes it spikes, you know, I don't know, for whatever reason it hits in the algorithm. Um, best selling uh, in terms of raw sales is buy buttons. So that's at buybuttonsbook.com. Um, I did a full like you know, income analysis for the first year of the launch and like all the different income streams from the book. And it was probably close to 19,000 in profit from the first year, um, which kind of goes to show you like I had a decent sized email list. It made decent money, but it wasn't like quit your job kind of money. So you have to think of publishing either as a top of the funnel exercise or a bottom of the funnel exercise, in which case it's probably going to be a portfolio type of business. I mean, even look at somebody like uh, a Mike Michalowicz is like, you know, traditionally published tons of awesome books out there but it's a portfolio business. Like he's got to keep cranking them out. And that's the feeder for him for the business. I love that kind of the two ways of looking at it. Um, what about why free? I'm sure a lot of people wonder that it's like, well, hold up, why free? And then a lot of people have probably never even heard of the term perma free. So yeah. why free and how does this fit in with your business model? So why free um, trying to figure out the uh, lowest friction point, like how to get somebody into your ecosystem, uh, you know, make it super easy for them. At least that was my, that was my thought. Um, Permafree is not something that Amazon advertises. As you know, you know, you could be on KDP Select, you get your five free days every quarter. Um, this is a little bit of a different beast where you have to put your book up for sale on a different platform. I want to say it was either iBooks or Google Books or Smashwords or something like this. Um, and set the price at zero. And then you send Amazon uh, Kindle support, a nice letter and, or a nice email and you say, hey, um, it's free over here. Would you, would you consider price matching it? And sometimes they'll say no, but most of the time they'll say yes. And it might take a couple uh, requests to get that done. Um, and then it just, it sits out there for, for life uh, until I think I updated something in the book and then it changed. And then I had to like, oh, send it. I was like, oh no, like what happened to the, the sales numbers or what happened to the download numbers? But uh, if you, if you send them a nice note, again, they tend to reset that. Um, the way that works for my business model is like primarily, because uh, like even today, like self-publishing is a fun income stream, but it's not a huge piece of the pie. I mean, the main business for me is advertising on the podcast. It's affiliate income through the site. And then the third leg of the stool is that, you know, those side hustle experiments, the self-publishing stuff, the e-commerce stuff that I did back in the day, the freelancing stuff that I did back in the day, the other 
you know, affiliate website that I had, the virtual assistant site was, you know, kind of that third leg of the stool, but recognizing that, okay, even if this book blows up and becomes this bestseller, it's still going to be, uh, you know, it's not, I don't know. I, like, of course I love author royalties, but just recognizing that, you know, if you could reduce the friction, then that's probably a more beneficial thing than trying to collect, you know, your two, three bucks of, uh, of royalties on every sale. Got it. So you're making the money on the back end as a driver for business. Sounds like 20 to 30 um, free downloads a day. How do you, how do you take that? Uh, how do, what happens after that? I mean, obviously there's, there's probably a lead, lead capture. I'm guessing it's in the first part of the book. The goal is to get them to join your email list since Amazon doesn't give you their info. What happens next? Like how does that turn into leads and income? Yeah, there are a couple lead capture points in the book. I think it says, you know, here's three free ways to join Side Hustle Nation. There's the email list. Um, you can join here. I'll send you my five fastest ways to make extra money. There's the Side Hustle Nation community. It's the largest, most supportive, helpful, friendly community of side hustlers out there. It's free to join. Um, and there's also this podcast. You know, it's available in your favorite podcast player app. Here's three free ways that you can join the community if you like this stuff. Um, you know, I don't have good metrics on how many people like take me up on that. I probably could have, you know, a dedicated landing page. that's like specifically for the book, but I think it's probably one that I have recycled and used in other places as well. And then, and then it's the content of the book itself where it's like, you know, you're sharing these interesting stories and always being upfront saying, Hey, you know, we talked to, to so-and-so on the podcast and this was their experience. This was how much they're selling. And my hope is, and again, I don't have great Podcast, podcast analytics are awful. Um, don't have great metrics on this, but my hope is somebody would see that and say like, oh, I would like to check out the full interview or what else has this guy got? This like, this all sounds really interesting. Let me learn more. Um, so that's why mm. I see it as kind of a, a, a an intro to Nick, an intro to Side Hustle Nation and yeah. hopefully an appetizer platter that that helps you, uh, makes you want more. Yeah. Well, and it, and it, that's smart because it fleshes out the ecosystem, right? Where it's like, all right, you listen to the podcast, you should download the side hustle book. <laughs> um, and if you download and read the side hustle book, that brings you back to the podcast, brings you to the newsletter and kind of just, it's it's like an e a little bit of an ecosystem, it sounds like. Yeah, it's just another another touch point. Yeah. And so they can go book first, then podcast. They can go podcast first, then book. It's kind of similar to what we started off the interview with, which is probably thinking, oh, people are going to go to the podcast and then download the book. But then over time, I'm sure it's been a little bit of both, which is like people are in a lot of cases discovering the book first. And so it's almost like a listener. That's interesting. It's almost like a listener acquisition <laughs> for the side hustle show is the fact that you have this book that's then bringing yeah. people into the ecosystem. Yeah, very much so. I'm trying to think of all these different, you know, tentacles you could spread out into the universe and try and reach, try to reach people. Cause it's like, I, you know, I've been doing this for eight years. I'm super excited yeah. about it. I think that, you know, everybody ought to have, you know, some entrepreneurial skill set. And this is like, it's genuinely exciting to, to talk about and share these stories. And so it's like, well, where else might be somebody looking for this information? How yeah. can I get them, get them over there? That's great. What, um, how have you gotten 800 plus reviews on this book? Anything special or the thing that you've done that's worked well that people could replicate? Which one is that? Um, eight, yeah, right. Um, 800 plus, you're at 803 as of today um, okay. on the side hustle book. So congrats. Oh, nice. So it's probably recently passing 800. How have you done it? Yeah, just for sheer volume. Um, Cause it is free. This that's probably the only way. I mean, I probably ask for a review at the end of the book, like, Hey, you know, if you found this helpful, drop in a review on Amazon. Nice. Um, but no, there's no dedicated review funnel. Like you see with, um, uh, with like a James clear or somebody like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, so you've got what we would call a review plea page at the end, like, Hey, leave a review. And one thing you should do is we call this a review sweeper. Um, that's just, it's a simple, it's like 21 days after they download any lead magnet connected to the book, they get an email and it's okay. like, Hey, I'd love to hear what you think of the book, R hit reply to this email. And then they reply. And then you can just say, Hey, copy and pay. Hey, like, thanks so much for the feedback. Would you mind copying and pasting that here in an Amazon review? Yeah. I love it. We call it the review sweeper. Cause it just keeps sweeping up. And it's like a three email email sequence. It's super yeah. simple, but the first one being, uh, a two-step of like reply to the email and then you or someone on your team says, hey, thanks so much. 
assuming it's positive. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, <laughs> to say the book sucks. Say thanks so much for your feedback. Uh, here's a competitor's book. Can you copy and paste that there? <laughs> no, but uh, that that could work well. I mean, you're doing you're doing well, obviously, even without that. So, hey, we we've got a few minutes left. I'd love to switch gears to the next book. Um, so I know we were talking kind of before the interview. Uh, you've got this next book, One K a Hundred Ways. What, yeah. What what One. sparked that? And uh, I mean, is that the unofficial title or the official title? Like how are you approaching this process different? Yeah, I'm committed to that title. I, I advertised that probably way too early in the process and it was more challenging than I thought it might be to come up with a hundred like compelling stories, but 1k100ways.com, I'm trying to uh, showcase and highlight some creative and uh, successful members of the Side Hustle Nation community. So again, another another way to repurpose podcast content, another way to involve members of the email list, you know, members of the community who haven't gotten on the podcast yet, maybe. And on top of that, I've sourced some some guests from the outreach for that. So that started as um, an email to the list. I said, like, uh, do you want to be in my next book, or do you, you want to help me out with this project? I forget how I phrased it or what the subject line was, but that led to a Google uh, form intake that asked um, asked everybody the same questions, like, you know, what's your elevator pitch? Um, how much did it cost to get started? Where, you know, what is the most effective marketing tactics have you found? You know, what does a business typically make today? How long did it take to get to this thousand dollar milestone? You know, what's next for you? And stuff, and it's just stuff like that. And so through that, you know, very generic question base, you pulled out a ton of different really creative business models, like in freelancing, in online business, in e-commerce. And so it's now the process of kind of compiling all that. The challenge was, and this is why it's been like a nine month project is, uh, you know, I probably could have done a better job of like giving people guidelines of like, you know, be, be detailed. Like we can always edit stuff out after the fact, but we can't really put uh. words in your mouth. And so some people would give us a hundred words and other people would give us 1500 words. And it's like, well, how do we make this consistent? And it's like, well, this, this might be compelling. So there's a lot of back and forth trying mm. to like pull answers out of people to get a, uh, a decent profile uh, out of it. But going through the edits now, and it's got me re-energized for nice. for both for self-publishing and for uh, to get these stories out there because they're really cool. That's exciting. I anything that you learned from that because I, I feel like sometimes it sounds like you you said it's like given better guidelines, but I guess there's there's both sides of the spectrum, which is like, if you're so specific and detailed, no one will fill out the form. But then if you're, I mean, obviously you've got a, a sizable audience, so that certainly helps, but anything from like an interview contributor book, cause I know a lot of people in our world, they want to start with that as their first book. And they don't realize like, oh, now I've got to wait on all these people. Like any tips to navigate that or anything else you've kind of learned in that process? Yeah, I did. I did set a deadline, which was helpful. And then nice. I uh, didn't have enough, so extended the deadline and extended the deadline and went back and forth and, you know, pulled from different interviews. Again, having the transcripts is like, well, somebody just, you know, sat down with me for an hour on the podcast interview, and now you're asking them to go fill out this whole other form where they got to type this stuff out. So I was able to use the the transcriptions from the podcast to like fill in a lot of that for them and be like, oh, there was one question I should have asked, but didn't like, would you mind filling in the gap here? Um, and that's been helpful to get, uh, you know, to fill in the gaps that way. But it's been it's been a slog, man. I kind of forgot like what the publishing process is, is like. It's been a couple of years for me. Yeah. Hey, this has been really helpful, Nick. Thanks so much, man. What would be uh, what would be kind of parting piece of advice for uh, think back to Nick from how many ever books ago, pre book one, and all the other Nicks out there who are maybe this is their their foray into a side hustle or they're just thinking about writing and publishing a book, like. Knowing what you know now, what would be your advice to past Nick, aka other Nicks? Um, yeah, I would think of the book is the top of the funnel rather than the bottom of the funnel. I thought of the book as like this product that I was going to sell, but it's like a five dollar thing, and so it was just hard. It was just such a volume game to try and uh, make any sort of meaningful income uh, out of it. So uh, think top of the funnel. Think. Uh, of your book as a digital asset. And it's something that you can create once and it goes out into the world and does your bidding. Like that's a really powerful thing. So I think of a lot of the content that I create, whether it's 
YouTube videos, whether it's blog posts, whether it's books, whether it's courses, whether it's, you know, whatever. It's like, how does this serve me long-term as this digital asset that can kind of run on autopilot, generate leads on autopilot, generate revenue on autopilot and serve your audience on autopilot. So that's kind of how I'm looking at uh, publishing these days. That's awesome. Nick, this has been great, man. It's so, so fun. It's been so long uh, since we've, we've done one of these interviews. So this has been a lot of fun. Where can people go to find out more about you, to buy your books, maybe even pre-order uh, the, the book coming out soon? You bet. So the new book is at 1k100ways.com. I think it's just a placeholder page uh, there at the moment, but sidehustlenation.com is the home base. If you sign up over there, you'll be notified as well. And of course, would love to have you tune into the Side Hustle Show, where we talk not just self-publishing, but all random uh, methods of starting a business and earning extra money in your spare time. Yeah, check out the podcast. I think we've got an episode way back in the day um, I think you're on there a couple times for sure. Okay. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and, uh, and also check out the book. It's free on Amazon. You can see the whole, uh, perma free thing, uh, how that works. You can check out the book, check out the podcast, Nick. Thanks so much, man. You bet.